Hello guys, I'm Grandmaster Grigor Grigorov and in my today's video I'm going to examine the, the must-know theoretical positions featuring the endgame Rook vs Bishop. In uh, my previous uh, video that you can found, find uh, on our YouTube channel, uh, you can uh, you can see my analysis of the endgame uh, Rook vs Knight. So, uh, before starting uh, with the concrete material, I would like to remind you that uh, all these videos uh, are a preparation for uh, our master class together with Grandmaster Dejan Boshkov. Uh, and this master class uh, will examine uh, some more complicated positions uh, which feature uh, the end games uh, Rook versus Minor Piece. And, uh, of course, uh, knowing uh, the main theoretical positions uh, will help you to prepare for this uh, master class. Once again, I remind that uh, those of you who will participate in the master class will get the PGM version of uh, the current lecture and also uh, the PGM version from the previous lecture. So, uh, without uh, wasting uh, more time, we are going to start dealing with the subject. Ro the, the end game uh, Rook versus uh, Bishop uh, is not so complicated uh, in its uh, purest form. So, on the board you have only Rook and, and the Bishop. Uh, there are just a few theoretical positions that you should know and uh, you are good enough to go. Actually, uh, the problem uh, comes when uh, there, there is a pawn, uh, for example, uh, the stronger side, the side which is playing with the rook, has one pawn and uh, sometimes uh, the position remains a draw, but sometimes, of course, and more often than not, uh, the stronger side will be winning. And actually, uh, all these positions uh, with a pawn on the board require uh, good uh, theoretical knowledge and uh, therefore uh, we are going to spend some time on uh, looking at them. But of course, uh, before proceeding uh, with the positions uh, uh, with a pawn on the board, we, we shall examine the main theoretical positions which feature only rook and bishop. So, uh, it's quite obvious that uh, if the king of the weaker side is in the center of the board, for example on e4, uh, and if, uh, let's say, we have the bishop on d4, okay, the position is um, quite an obvious draw. Uh, so, the only problem can arise when uh, the king uh, is in the corner. But, uh, as uh, we are going to witness, uh, it's not always the case. For example, uh, one of the basic drawish positions uh, that you should know is on the board. So the king is in the corner, but in the right corner. What does it mean, uh, right corner? Uh, when you have a dark squared bishop, so uh, the right corner for your king is the, uh, for example, a8 or h1 squares. Uh, so uh, in the white corner uh, should be uh, placed your king. So, uh, this rule is uh, pretty easy to remember. Um, so, you sh uh, the king should aim for the corner of the board uh, with, the, with a cover which is opposite to the cover of your bishop. And then the position is quite a simple draw. For example, um, let's, uh, let's say now it's black to move. You, you basically, uh, you make a draw just by playing bishop b8, bishop a7. And uh, actually, you cannot go wrong. Let's suppose that white plays uh, king b6, bishop a6, bishop a7, king a6, then bishop b8 again. And uh, white cannot make a progress in this position. Let's suppose that uh, white is trying to uh, create some mating ideas. Let's say rook g1, uh, threatening rook g8. But this is not a threat. Bishop f4, for example, is possible. Even bishop a7 is possible. Uh, th there is no difference. And whenever, uh, okay, whenever he gives a check, then uh, you close the way of the rook. And uh, actually, uh, white's problem is that uh, he cannot uh, make... Uh, 
a waiting move with the rook. For example, if he plays uh, rook h8, uh, we have a stalemate on the board. Uh, and uh, therefore, the, the rook should uh, leave the, the a rank with a move like rook g7. But then uh, you can uh, just uh, play with the bishop in this way. Rook a7, king b8, and it's obvious that white cannot make progress. Remember, this is a very important rule of a thumb. Um, when uh, you have a dark squared bishop, your king uh, is best placed in the white corner of the board and uh, vice versa. When you have white squared bishop, uh, you should aim for a dark square. For example, uh, if we have a white squared bishop, uh, this h8 and a1 squares will be perfect for, for our king. Let's uh, take a look at what happens uh, when our king is in the wrong corner of the board. So this is a typical situation. Uh, black has a dark squared bishop and uh, the king is near uh, to the h8 square. So this is a classical uh, losing position. Uh, no matter uh, the move order, regardless of the move or order, uh, black is going to lose this end game. For example, uh, let okay, let's suppose that it's black to move right now. He doesn't have uh, useful moves. Uh, okay, let's suppose bishop b4 uh, or something else. Uh, doesn't matter. Now, uh, actually, rook c8. Check. Bishop f8. And here uh, we can make a waiting move, just um, giving the move order to our opponent. And uh, black is in a Zugzwang situation. The only move is king h8, and then black is going to be mated. Rook takes f8. So uh, now uh, it's a pretty simple win for white. Okay, for example, in this position, after bishop uh, b4, uh, if it was black to move, uh, he would have played uh, king f8, and uh, then uh, obviously uh, the position is a draw. But uh, th this is not the case here, and white is winning. So uh, remember, uh, you should always know when you are playing uh, on the weaker side, you should always know which is the right corner for your king. Now, uh, we are going to see some examples which are a bit more complicated with a pawn on the with a pawn on the board, but uh, by using our this, our simple theoretical knowledge, we are going to solve uh, these examples in a pretty easy way. So let's take a look uh, at this simple position. White has a pawn on the board, the g6 pawn. And uh, actually, uh, it seems that this pawn is not quite dangerous for black because uh, black has a good control of the important uh, g7 square. But uh, actually, if you know the previous position, you will understand that white is uh, winning here. Why? The idea is pretty simple. Uh, under favorable circumstances, white can sacrifice the pawn, and uh, then uh, create, and then he can create mating threats. Uh, such a strategy would be successful because black's king uh, is in the wrong corner. He has a dark squared bishop, and uh, okay, uh, h8 square is a dark square. Therefore, white should be winning in this position. For example, here. Uh, you can uh, just pause the video and uh, think on yourself, but not. Uh, but uh, I should uh, mention that uh, one move is not enough. You you should see the entire sequence because uh, actually the second move of the sequence is uh, much more important. Okay, uh, now I'm going to uh, tell the answer uh, here. Why it actually can play g7? sacrificing the pawn. Quite obviously, black cannot accept uh, the sacrifice 
because after bishop takes g7 then uh, white is going to follow with king g6 and after a move like bishop f8 uh, we are going to uh, to have the same position as in the previous example uh, black is in a zook flank here and uh, he's losing on the spot so uh, after g7 what else uh, can black do the only move seems to be the uh, king uh, h8 king h7 uh, sorry uh, King h7, uh, just uh, to take the control of the g6 square. And here, uh, it's very important to know uh, how to proceed. Uh, now, uh, is it possible to sacrifice the pawn? Actually, uh, the, in this position, the move g8 lets the win slip away. Why? Uh, because uh, after king takes uh, g8, king g6, black can just uh, play king f8, uh, thus escaping from the wrong corner. This was demonstrated in, in the previous example, and now you can just see the same idea. What should white do uh, in order to prevent the evacuation of black's king? Actually, uh, when we know the idea, uh, I think that uh, the move should be fairly simple. Rook f7. Uh, the idea is just to take the control of the f8 square and now uh, you are ready to sacrifice the pawn in under more favorable circumstances. Now uh, the threat is g8, of course. So bishop c3, g8, queen. King takes g8, king g6, and thanks to the move rook f7, which restricts black's king, uh, white is winning. Why? Because black's king cannot escape from the corner, regardless of what uh, black plays, uh, white is winning. Uh, for example, uh, after bishop um, b2, we go rook b7, bishop a3, check. And once again, we have this basic position in which we uh, win by uh, transmitting the move to our opponent. A simple move like rook a8 uh, is just winning. Uh, before uh, proceeding uh, with the next examples, I would just like to mention that uh, after uh, rook f7, taking the pawn doesn't help black. Probably uh, while watching the video, some of you have asked uh, themselves what will happen after bishop takes g7 but here uh, king g5 um, is winning the the king should step back king g8 king g6 and uh, of course uh, regardless of where uh, the black bishop goes uh, we are going to put uh, him in a zugzwang situation for example bishop c3 rook c7 bishop b4 rook c8 bishop f8 and this simple move is just transmitting the move and black white is winning so uh, uh, you see uh, in in which way uh, we can just use our theoretical knowledge in order to uh, force the transition into a theoretically winning position okay uh, now let's take a look at another example uh, we have a pretty much similar situation here uh, this uh, position is winning for white because uh, the black king is in the wrong corner. Nevertheless, uh, we should pay attention because uh, black will try to evacuate his king from the dangerous area. For example, uh, his idea would be king h7 followed by king g6 or king h6 and then uh, the draw uh, will be obvious. And here, uh, if you want, uh, you can just uh, pause the video and uh, try to find uh, the right maneuver which um, prevents uh, Black from executing his intentions. Okay, I will give you two seconds. The right idea is Rook A6, taking control over the sixth rank and um, more specifically, uh, taking control of the squares g6 and h6. And now, uh, if uh, he, the opponent goes for bishop c3, then rook g6 is possible, king h7, and here, of course, king f7. 
uh, it's not uh, difficult to see that here uh, Black King is in a cage. He cannot escape uh, anymore. And uh, of course, um, we are going to win the game in, in our traditional fashion. For example, uh, let's say bishop b2, now uh, rook g2, threatening the bishop. And uh, of course, uh, there is uh, this threat of delivering a mate, bishop e5. But here, rook g5, once again, uh, we make this kind of a fork bishop f4 rook h5 and here quite obviously we can uh, just transmit the move to our opponent and uh, okay white is winning so rook a6 followed by rook g6 is a key idea in this position uh, we just uh, prevent uh, our opponent from evacuating the king uh, always remember this idea when the king of your opponent is in the wrong corner Another uh, interesting position, which is a bit more complicated, therefore uh, I would advise uh, that uh, you shall take a bit more time here. For example, five uh, minutes uh, will be enough. I think white can win uh, by force, but the win is not so simple. Okay. Uh, it's obvious that uh, white will need to sacrifice the d7 pawn because uh, in any case this pawn is doomed black will recapture it he is planning to follow with bishop f5 and then bishop d7 but after taking the pawn the black king uh, would like to reach the h8 square and uh, what should white do white should force the black king into occupying the wrong corner uh, so white, black has a white squared bishop, therefore we should force the black king to occupy the a8 square. And uh, what uh, we should do in order to achieve our goal? Uh, we should cut um, the way of the black king towards h8. Therefore, uh, the logical move would be rook e7. So taking control of the important e8 square. Let's suppose that instead of rook e7, you uh, immediately queen the pawn and then uh, play king d6. Quite obviously, black will play king e8 and then the game is a draw. The, uh, why? Because black's king is heading uh, towards the h8 square. The position is a draw. So after rook e7, it turns out that uh, black cannot uh, prevent white's idea from happening bishop f5 threatening to uh, win the pawn d8 king takes d8 now king d6 since there is a, an opposition uh, of course uh, white has mating threats for example in this position if uh, it was white to move he would have played rook f7 uh, winning the game threatening the bishop and threatening uh, to deliver a mate. So king c8 and here something very important. Do you remember the importance of this c7 square? In the previous examples it was f7. We have played rook f7 if you have remembered. But here uh, rook c7 is quite an important move just to force uh, the opponent's king to go to b8 and now it's quite obvious that uh, there is no way back uh, so black the black king can never go to the h8 square uh, why uh, king d8 is impossible because of the opposition if uh, he uh, starts with king d8 then rook f7 bishop g6 check and then rook h8 and uh, we have a familiar zugzwang this is a pattern that uh, all of you should know very well so after rook c7 king b8 it's already sure that uh, the black king will never get out of the dangerous area and uh, we can uh, we can just uh, improve the position of our king and uh, we will just arrange the mating construction king c6 bishop e4 king b6 and white is winning uh, so regardless of where the bishop goes uh, we attack it and then uh, we create the famous uh, pattern 
white is winning in this position. So uh, by showing these examples, I, I would like to, um, to give you the chance to practice your knowledge, to think uh, over the positions on your own, but at the same time, I would like to, uh, to, dem to demonstrate uh, how uh, decision making in complicated positions is related to the knowledge of the theoretical positions. And uh, just to avoid being misunderstood, I want to, I want to say that uh, you should not remember uh, the exact move order in every theoretical positions in every theoretical position. Uh, for sure, you will uh, forget it in a few days, but uh, when you know the typical patterns and uh, the evaluations of the theoretical positions, you will never forget them. So, uh, now uh, we shall take a look at some typical uh, uh, theoretical draws in which the stronger side has a pawn. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, the most important position uh, that you should know is on the board. So there is a bishop pawn on the sixth rank. And uh, nevertheless, uh, this is a theoretical draw. But uh, there is one very important condition. The bishop of the weaker side should be placed on the diagonal g8 a2 this is the key diagonal for the bishop and uh, in this way white cannot make progress another very important thing to know in this position is is that uh, black should always uh, be ready to met to meet uh, king g6 with a check uh, via this diagonal uh, otherwise uh, white will win the game now uh, we are going to see White's different attempts to create practical problems and, uh, of course, uh, Black's most precise defense. Here, uh, rook, for example, rook c7 uh, is a possible idea. Uh, uh, let's suppose that instead of rook c7, he goes for rook d7, actually creating the threat of king g6 because uh, in this way bishop d3, d3 would not be possible. Okay, you just uh, move the bishop and you should make sure that your bishop is on the diagonal a to g8. This is first and second. You, you should make sure that whenever the white king goes to g6, you can uh, deliver a check. It's not, uh, it's not that uh, complicated. So uh, white can play king f5, king, king, king f5 for example. Uh, here check, bishop b3, rook b7, bishop c4, and we are just waiting. And don't forget, whenever white goes for f7, which is very important, uh, you should not take the pawn. Why? Because if you take the pawn, you already know white's main winning pattern in this position king f6 and if uh, the bishop goes somewhere check and then uh, the familiar zugzwang so what uh, why black should do instead of uh, taking the pawn obviously he cannot allow king f6 because the game uh, will be winning for white therefore king g7 and only then you can uh, recapture the pawn First of all, you should prevent the opponent's king uh, from reaching the f6 square and then uh, you can uh, just uh, capture the pawn. Okay, let's return to the main line. Rook c7, bishop a2. Bishop a2 uh, is uh, the normal move. But uh, before uh, before proceeding with the main line, I just want to show where is the danger and why uh, it's so important to keep the bishop on the diagonal a2 g8. Let's say that instead of bishop a2, we go bishop b5, which is a terrible mistake. Then f7 with the idea of king f6, 
King G7. King F5. Okay, uh, the threat is King E6 followed by King E7. Therefore, Bishop A4. And here, uh, King E6 is impossible due to Bishop B3 check. But we have Rook B7. Rook B7 taking control of the B3 square. And uh, it's uh, very interesting to see that uh, if Bishop C6 now, White can play King E6 because the Bishop uh, comes uh, close to the King and the D5 square is not available. And if he takes the Rook, then King E7 is winning. Okay, after uh, Rook B7, what uh, can uh, Black do? Bishop D1. Uh, the only idea is that uh, after king e6, black can play bishop h5 now, just preventing king e7. But uh, whenever the bishop of your opponent is on this short diagonal, h5, e8, you're winning. But first of all, uh, you should um, uh, provoke your opponent to put his bishop on g6. Why? Because on g6 the bishop will be vulnerable. For example, uh, you play rook c7, uh, waiting move, and whenever uh, you play rook g6, bishop g6, sorry, then queen and king f6, and then we have the, this familiar zugzwang. So uh, we can uh, draw the conclusion that uh, in such cases, uh, a, a diagonal which consists only of four squares is not uh, enough for the bishop. Uh, in order to be able to control the pawn, uh, the bishop should be on a longer diagonal, at least five squares. And uh, okay, this diagonal is uh, pretty much okay for the bishop. Now uh, we proceed with the main line. So bishop a2, rook c1, bishop d5, don't forget, we just make sure that king g6 can be met by bishop e4. This is the most important thing that you should know. Now, uh, king f5, king f7, king e5, bishop b3, check, king f8. It's normal. We just move the bishop on the diagonal. For, for the moment, there is no threat. Rook b4, bishop a2, king f5. Okay, now uh, bishop d5 is possible. Why? Because after uh, king g6, we can deliver a check via f7. But for example, uh, if you play uh, the careless king f7, then you're losing on the spot. Just check and king g6. And now uh, b1 square is not available for the bishop, but also white uh, has taken the control of the f7 square. There are no checks and white is winning. Always, um, always pay attention to this important factor. Whenever the king of your opponent reaches the g6 square, you should be uh, available to deliver a check. And at the same time, your bishop should be on this diagonal, g8, a2. If you follow these two simple rules, you will never face a problem defending such positions. So king g6, bishop f7, king g5, and okay, you see that uh, regardless of what uh, white does, uh, your defense is uh, pretty straightforward. And then uh, we just uh, can uh, finish this example uh, with uh, white's last uh, chance, white last, white's last attempt uh, to win the game, f7. Okay, the idea is pretty simple, king f6. And if you take the pawn, uh, you will find yourself in a Zugzwang situation, just in this way. If it, it was white to move, then king, G, king g6 can be played. So once again, you should take the f6 square uh, from the white king by playing king e7. And then the draw is obvious. Uh, we control the pawn, but uh, as, as we can see, uh, this diagonal is not four squares. It's uh, long enough and uh, uh, the bishop has no problems. The bishop is not limited. 
So here rook g6, rook g7, bishop b3, f8, for example, king f6. But the king uh, will escape, no problems whatsoever. So actually, uh, this was the game uh, was was Sabo, uh, Mikhail Butvinnik, which was played in 1952. And uh, actually, uh, Butvinnik uh, managed uh, to find uh, the right defense. So uh, these are the most important uh, positions that you should know uh, with the F pawn. And uh, here uh, I will finish the lecture with some examples uh, featuring uh, the H pawn when the stronger side uh, has the H pawn at his disposal. And uh, let's let's take a look at first of all at this important position. Sorry, uh, first of, first of all, uh, we are going to see this one. Uh, so th actually, this is a draw. This position is a theoretical draw that you should know. Uh, but uh, once again, there are two important conditions in order to achieve the draw. The bishop uh, should be on this diagonal, b1, h7. And the king shouldn't be in the corner of the board. Therefore, if it's black to move in this position, black will make a draw by playing king g8. This is a very important. So you should always remember these two ideas. You should take control of the diagonal b1 h7, and the bishop should not be and sorry, and the king should not be on h8. And now, if uh, white delivers a check, what is the precise move? I, I think that a few seconds uh, will be enough for you to see that the king f8 is the right defense. Let's suppose that white goes for uh, rook g4, then bishop c2. No, no problems whatsoever. White cannot make progress. Rook d4, bishop b1, check, king f7, rook d2. Uh, if white goes for king g5 uh, with the idea of pushing the pawn, then just uh, king uh, g7. And here, actually, uh, there is something important. If uh, you give, a, if he gives a check or a check with the pawn, uh, king h7 check. Uh, this is uh, this is also a draw. Uh, for for example, if king f6 then bishop c2, the, the bishop uh, will be on this diagonal, b1, h7 diagonal, and the king uh, in the corner. Uh, when the pawn is on h6, the king can occupy the corner of the board, and uh, th there is no problem. Why? Uh, if he uh, pushes the pawn, you, we just take and we, uh, we reach the position which was discussed in the very first example uh, of this lecture. Uh, this is uh, the famous theoreti theoretical position in which um, our king is in the right corner. So uh, th there is no problem here. So remember when the white pawn reaches the h6 square, you can go to the corner of, of the board. But when it's on the fifth rank, you should avoid uh, being in the corner. Okay, so rook d2 here, bishop e4, rook f2, king g8, and white cannot make any progress. In this, in this example, uh, I have said that uh, you should your king uh, should not uh, be in the corner of the board when the pawn is on the fifth rank. But why? Uh, we should give uh, some kind of an explanation. And uh, here comes a typical example. This is a famous study, uh, which dates from uh, 80, 1858, 1858 mm, famous position. Here, since the king is in the corner and the pawn is on the fifth rank, uh, white is winning. Uh, how white can win in this position? Rook b7 just forcing the bishop into uh, g8, bishop a2, rook b8, check, bishop uh, g8. 
Okay, here in this position, uh, of course, um, you should know uh, how uh, how to win it with white. Actually, the winning strategy is quite simple. There is one simple technique uh, technique that you should know and everything uh, will be simple for you. Of course, here King G6 is impossible due to the stalemate. Therefore, uh, King G5 is pretty much obvious. King H7. Rook B7. King H8. And now, uh, since uh, the bishop is not pinned, we can uh, play king g6 and the important moment comes here uh, it's uh, important it's important to to know a, a pattern which uh, allows you to win a decisive tempo in this position and the technique is works quite simple first of all you deliver a check in order to provoke an a position the opposition will allow you to create a mating threat and then you should parry the threat of bishop e4 check by means of rook e7 and now you you have this mating threat and at the same time you take the control of the e4 square therefore uh, your opponent cannot improve the bishop he does not have time to improve uh, the bishop but he should uh, waste time on a passive defensive move Let's suppose king h8 again, and then you push the pawn. Bishop a2, and now you can uh, just push the pawn, because after bishop b1, king h6 is winning. Let's suppose that here, instead of bishop c4, bishop d5, uh, your opponent goes bishop c4. Okay, you can just pause the video for one minute and uh, apply the same winning technique here it it works in, in in the same way first of all we give a check in order to uh, provoke the opposition and after king g8 then rook d7 taking the d3 square uh, from the bishop and uh, creating a mating threat and okay if he goes in here then you just push the pawn then h7 and king h6 it's very very simple Okay, now uh, you already know uh, why uh, it's very dangerous uh, to have a king in the corner when the pawn is on the uh, fifth rank. We have said that uh, when the pawn is on the sixth rank, it's already uh, not, not a problem. Okay, now uh, we are going to take a look at one last position in which the pawn is uh, on the fourth rank okay the same uh, it's the same situation at, as in in one of the previous examples here uh, the the king of the weaker side is not in the corner it's on g8 the bishop is on this the right diagonal b1 h7 but here white is winning just because of the fact that his pawn is not on h5 but on h4 and uh, it's uh, not so obvious uh, to understand it uh, the reason is uh, is simple actually uh, actually it turns out that it's very important uh, to have the h5 square available for the escape of the king as we are going to see in many variations uh, the white king uh, manages to escape uh, via the h5 square uh, and here um, white is winning okay first of all rook g7 check is important here king f8 uh, should be played we already know that uh, this move loses to h5 the, the pawn is on the fifth rank and uh, the king is in the corner so this is a winning position for for white uh, you can just take a look at the previous example in order to uh, to refresh your memory so here king f8 should be played but now after rook g5 uh, we can see an, an idea that was not available in positions with the pawn on h5 now king h5 followed by king g4 can be uh, an idea in many examples 
uh, here king f7 is the best move but i i just want to uh, to give an example which illustrates the practical use of this idea based on king h5 for example uh, let's suppose that uh, our opponent goes for uh, bishop c2 and then king h5 if he goes king f7 then king g4 and this is what we want the king is not on the way of the pawn and uh, the, the king of our op opponent is cut off king f6 we push the pawn we push it and uh, now uh, it's uh, pretty obvious that white is winning h7 is coming and uh, black will lose the game okay maybe you can ask yourselves uh, what will happen if in this position uh, black just delivers a check and after king g6 he goes for uh, king g8 king g8 is the only move by the way because after white wants to play for example a move like king f6 and then just start pushing the pawn therefore king g8 okay everything is correct the king is here not in the corner but the bishop is not on this diagonal and therefore this g6 square is already available for uh, the white king and here the be the most precise move is to play rook c5 the logic is simple you should deprive the bishop of your opponent from occupying uh, this square c2 and if he goes here then check and just start pushing the pawn very simple stuff we, uh, we, you don't know to remember all the variations you just know know uh, some simple rules of a thumb and uh, by using these rules you've always find the best continuation okay let's return to the main line rook g5 planning king h5 followed by king g4 now king f7 rook g3 uh, threatening the bishop with a tempo and then uh, uh, making the g5 square available for the king and here the bishop should go far away because if he if the opponent uh, chooses e4 square for the bishop there is a typical pattern that you should remember king g5 we have time to evacuate the king why because if our opponent uh, plays king g7 then king f4 discover check the bishop is hanging so bishop c2 is a possible option and now we have time to play king h5 we have time to play king h5 once again uh, due to the fact that the pawn is not on h5 let's see uh, two main lines first of all uh, what will happen if he plays bishop d1 king g5 king g7 maybe at this point you should pause the video for some minutes and uh, try to find uh, white's best uh, move uh, actually winning the game i think it's it, it is not going to be difficult because uh, we know the basic idea we should prevent the bishop of our opponent from occupying this diagonal b1 h7 therefore rook c3 would be the solution the bishop uh, should waste a lot of time in order to return to this diagonal meanwhile uh, white will win the game uh, actually uh, the very same position arised in the game petrosian petrosian uh, ivanovich and i will just show how the game went bishop e2 h5 here now uh, bishop a6 check king uh, h8 king g6 bishop b7 and now it's already simple bishop g8 and here in this position rook e7 bishop d5 h7 we know uh, in the fashion uh, that i have uh, sh i have already demonstrated so bishop g6 um, black is playing uh, for a stalemate but it will never happen rook d7 we we threaten to deliver a mate now rook d8 would uh, lead to a stalemate so rook d6 
and actually rook f6, uh, rook f8 is the winning maneuver. So bishop d7, rook f6, and now uh, it turns out that uh, black can do nothing against the mate. So uh, king f6 should be uh, the right uh, move. So king f6, okay, and here rook g5. The threat is king g4, followed by king f4, and then you just start pushing the pawn. Okay, you will say there is a check, and uh, we cannot uh, we cannot uh, play king g4, and uh, the g5 square is not available. But uh, here there is something very important. Uh, actually, uh, with with king h6 uh, we create an opposition and the threat is rook g1 followed by rook f1 uh, in this way uh, the king will go far away from the center from the h pawn sorry so uh, king f7 but here uh, we have uh, a known position uh, in which white is winning because the black bishop is not on this diagonal rook g7 check and if he goes for king f8 how can I use the fact that the bishop is not on the diagonal? Just king g6, king f6, and then you start pushing the pawn. Okay, king f6, we uh, attack the bishop once again at rook f2. So uh, it turns out that uh, the move king h5 actually uh, provokes king f6, which is not a good square for the king, and then uh, after king f6 we are winning because after rook g5 we have two uh, main ideas first of all king g4 and and then king f4 and the second idea is uh, king h6 in, in case of necessity creating a position and then uh, we can um, we can just uh, throw away uh, the black king uh, by uh, by a check uh, along the f file and here, instead of king f6, uh, we have uh, we have seen that there is no move. Uh, after bishop d1, we have just said that white can win in this way. Another option would be bishop b1, just to try uh, to keep the bishop on the diagonal. But now uh, white have time to play uh, rook g5 followed by king g4. And uh, then he is winning. Another idea would be bishop a4, but here uh, once again king g5 is possible. Why? Because uh, the bishop cannot occupy uh, the diagonal b1 h7. Why? Because we can just play rook c3 with a uh, winning position. So, uh, guys, uh, these were the most important uh, theoretical positions that you should know uh, in the endgame rook versus bishop. And I think that uh, the knowledge of these positions uh, is a good preparation for the uh, forthcoming uh, master class with, with uh, Grandmaster Dejan Boshkov. Once again, I remind you uh, that uh, you will get a PGM version uh, of this lecture with um, more examples and studies. And uh, this PGM version will uh, help you to further uh, improve your understanding of uh, these endgames. I hope uh, that uh, you have enjoyed uh, the lecture and uh, that it was useful. Thank you for watching and see you soon.